Matthew. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this time, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And the other servants saw what had happened. They were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all of the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he paid back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I really believe that it's one of those questions that soon as it leaves your lips, you wish you wouldn't have asked. Peter says, Lord, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And Simon Peter had had quite a bit of experience with Jesus, and he's probably thinking to himself, I shouldn't have asked. Indeed, Jesus says not seven times, but 70 times seven. And then he goes on and tells this parable of the unmerciful servant. And really, the point of the parable is very clear. It is absolutely an imperative to forgive freely, freely, frequently, and regardless. That's the point of the parable. For those who would follow after Jesus... We are called to forgive freely, frequently, and regardless. That Greek word there uh, in, the, in the gospel for forgive, it literally means to send off or to hurl, to release, to let it go. And it's not a, it's not a passive word, but it's a word that uh, it, it really connotates a very intense action, an intense action of dismissing something, of throwing it away, never to be visited again. That's the literal meaning of forgive. And so for the listeners of Jesus' day, and perhaps to us, Jesus' command and his teaching sounds absurd. Forgive freely, frequently, regardless. Forgiving others, friends, is serious business. And it is a serious part of following after Jesus Christ. So for just a few moments this morning, let's look at this passage of Scripture and ask ourselves again, even though we probably shouldn't have asked, what does forgiving others require? What will it require for me to be able to forgive others? Well, first of all, forgiving others requires a new memory. It requires a new memory. Why? <laughs> because it requires me never to forget what God has done for me. That's one of the points of the parable. Never forget what do God has done for me. I've hurt God. We, we've hurt God. We've sinned against God. We've embarrassed God. We've ignored God. Yet, he died for you and me. In order to forgive another person, and to make that a regular part of our discipleship, we have to have a memory that is cross-shaped and mercy-filled. Cross-shaped and mercy-filled. 
That's the prayer. That's where it starts. Lord, give me a memory that's cross-shaped and mercy-filled so that I'll never forget what you've done for me. Because if I can remember that, then surely I would never withhold forgiveness from another. George Bookman, he writes that he was still fuming one day when he called his dad. His dad was now up in his 70s. And he's announced to his dad, I just threw George Jr. out of the house. Why is that, his dad asked. Well, once again, he was out with his college buddies and he came home drunk. And I told him, I'm not going to have it in my house. I'm done with that boy. He said there was this long pause as his dad listened. And he said to him, George, your judgment is harsh because your memory is short. And he went on to relay a time when he, as a youngster, came home intoxicated. Your judgment is harsh because your memory is short. That's what happens to us, isn't it? The only way I could possibly harshly judge another person who may have sinned against me or maybe sin in general is if my memory is very short. And I forget what God has already done for me. So friends, the first step in forgiving others, it requires a new memory. Secondly, forgiving others requires a new model. A new model, a new example. What, who do we look to as the example? Well, he says, forgive as we forgive. It's the number one sentence that people would eliminate from the Lord's Prayer if they could. <laughs> yes, that's true. Retreat settings, all sorts of things. You ask people, if you could eliminate any sentence from the Lord's Prayer and not have to pray it, what would it be? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We've already prayed it this morning. I'll bet you didn't eliminate it. But did you think about what you were praying? It's a dangerous prayer. Because it's saying we are to model our practice of forgiveness after God's own practice. Bishop Desmond Tutu, the famous South African bishop, in his book, An African Prayer Book, tells the story of a man who had a very besetting sin. And he used to confess it to God and God would forgive him. But no sooner had he been absolved of his sin that he went back up and he would trip up again and sin again. And Tutu says that one day this happened again and he rushed back to God and he said, God, I'm sorry, I've done it again. To which God asked, what have you done again? For you see, Desmond Tutu says, God suffers from amnesia when it comes to our sins. God doesn't look at the caterpillar we are now, but he looks at the dazzling butterfly that we have in us to become. And he reminds us that in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus bids us to ask God to forgive us as we forgive those who have wronged us. And then Bishop Tutu says this, not to forgive others, is to shut the door to our own being forgiven. Boy, that's harsh language. When I asked Jesus, what's it require for me to forgive? I, I wish I wouldn't have asked. I shouldn't have asked. Because that's the model. That's the model that he puts before us in this teaching and in this parable in Matthew's gospel. And if we want to have a life that is full and filled, friends, we must move toward the point of being able to forgive, to practice the forgiveness that has been given to us. Lewis Meads in his classic book, Forgive and Forget, says it this way, Jesus grabs the hardest thing in the bag, forgiving. And he says we have to perform it or we're out in the cold, way out in the boondocks of the unforgiven. Jesus is tough because the incongruity, listen to this, the incongruity of sinners forgiving, refusing to forgive sinners. Let me say that again. The incongruity of sinners refusing to forgive sinners boggles God's mind. He can't cope with it. There's no honest way for him to put up with it. I like that from Smeads. He's reminding us again in the strongest of language. And this parable of Jesus is one of the hardest parables in the, in the Gospels. 
our model for forgiving others. Forgive as we forgive. Jesus Christ himself is our model. Third, forgiving others requires a new mind. A new mind. The only way it can possibly happen for me to forgive others is if I have the mind of Christ. In Philippians 2, it says, Let this mind be in you as was in Christ Jesus. So I have to have the mind of Christ living in me, abiding in me, if I'm really going to be able to practice forgiving others. And Philippians goes on to talk about the way that Jesus emptied himself. He poured himself out. He didn't think of himself. He thought of us when he went to the cross. There's an old song that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And friends, that's the kind of mind we need to be demonstrating towards other people. I had a Sunday school teacher once who said, good people have a terrible time with selfless love and forgiveness. Good people. Why? Because he said they think at some level they deserve the goodness and others do not. So sometimes those of us who may consider ourselves good church people, we have more, we have a harder time with selfless love and forgiveness because deep down inside we're kind of thinking, Maybe I deserve a little bit of this goodness. I'm a pretty good person. No, friends, that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. To have the mind of Christ means we empty ourselves as he did. One author put it this way. The boat of self-righteousness. The boat of self-righteousness fills up quickly with self-justification, self-pity, self-loathing, or just plain self-centeredness. Boy, that's true, and it will sink your boat every time. So friends, we need to change boats. Instead of being engaged in self-pity, self-righteousness, self-justification, self-centered living, we need to change boats because those things fill up our boat and sink us. We need to have a boat that's buoyed up, that's lifted up, through selfless living and sacrificial giving, surrendered hearts and actions. Let this mind be in you. Friends, the only way to take the step toward forgiving others in a meaningful fashion, as Jesus instructs us here in Matthew, is if we allow his mind to be within us. That's the new mind that we need. Finally, forgiving others requires a new mission. A new mission. What? What is a mission? What does our mission have to do with that? Well, notice Jesus starts the parable and says, the kingdom is like this. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Sometimes we fail to realize that a large part of our mission as the church and as individual disciples is to not only forgive others, to, but to seek out those who need to feel forgiven so that they can be set free to live for Jesus Christ. This is part of our mission. And friends, if we shirk this mission, we are ignoring the parable of Jesus here in Matthew's Gospel. Part of our mission is the mission of forgiveness, a large part. Because how many people are hurting or injured because they simply need to feel and know assuredly that they've been forgiven. The kingdom is like this, Jesus says. You want to live in the kingdom? This is how you'll be living. Let me say it this way. Kathleen Norris, in her book, Amazing Grace, she tells of a Benedictine nun who was keeping vigil at her dying mother's bedside. And seeking to comfort her mother, the nun said to her, In heaven, everyone we love is there. No, her mother responded. In heaven, I will love everyone who is there. There's a difference, isn't there? Heaven, every love we, everything we love, everyone we love is there. No, no, no. You will love everyone who's there because that is how the kingdom of God works operates. Friends, we have a kingdom mission as the church. You are engaged in a kingdom mission as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Is it easy? No. I wish I wouldn't have asked. 
about forgiveness, but you can't ignore it in the Gospels. In closing, Gregory Jones, in his book, Embodying Forgiveness, tells the story of a Turkish officer who raided and looted an Armenian home. He killed the old parents, the elderly parents. He gave the daughters to the soldiers, and he kept the oldest daughter for himself. Sometime later, she escaped, and she trained as a nurse. As time passed, she found herself nursing in a ward of Turkish officers. One night, by the light of a lantern, she saw the face of this officer. He was so gravely ill that without exceptional nursing care, he surely would die. The days passed, and he recovered. One day, the doctor stood by the bed with her and said to him, But for your devotion, but for her devotion to you, you would be dead. He looked at her and said, We've met before, haven't we? Yes, she said. We have met before. Why didn't you kill me? The officer asked her. And she replied, Because I'm a follower of him who said, Love your enemies. Friends, part of our mission as the church and our mission as followers of Jesus Christ is to hear the very strong, urgent words coming forth from his teaching today and know that we are called to forgive, to love, in a way that seems next to impossible to us. So that may be the close today. You say, Ken, I understand. We're to be forgiving of others, and I understand it requires a a new memory and a new model and a new mind and a new mission. I'm just not sure I can do it. All of these new things that need to happen in my life. Friends, I'll tell you assuredly, you can't do it. That's right. You, in your own power, cannot do this. But we serve and worship a God today who makes all things new. I only know one person who makes all things new, who makes us new creations in Jesus Christ. So I invite you today to turn it all over to him and ask him to create within you a new spirit, a new heart, these new things that are involved and necessary in order to forgive others. It's an urgent mission that we have. I want you to think of that person that needs forgiveness from you or in general. I want you to pray for them today. And I want you to find a way to go to them, to write them a note, to let them know that just as we have been forgiven, so also in Christ all are forgiven, and we can be set free to live life full and filled. Will you pray with me? Lord, the teachings come our way that are so challenging that they press us to our knees. Maybe that's where we need to be. Indeed, on our knees before the cross, remembering all that you've done for us in Jesus Christ so that we can freely offer that forgiveness to others, experiencing again your awesome, majestic, amazing grace, so that we can be set free to live, to live joyfully and to live in loving relationships with all people and especially with those that may have wronged us or that we consider to be enemies. Again, we pray for forgiveness, but help us not to be haphazard in asking for that forgiveness. For we know that out of it flows the necessity for our own forgiving of others. Make us new creatures. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. The song says, Amazing grace, how sweet.